honor to introduce this evening's guest. Jennifer Clement, although U.S. born, grew up in Mexico City, Mexico, and has lived there almost her entire life. She studied English literature and anthropology at New York University and French in Paris. She was president of Penn Mexico from 2009 to 2012, a position she took in part due to the threats against the lives of journalists in Mexico. Clement is the author of the memoir, Widow Basquiat, and three novels, a true story based on lies, which was a finalist for the Orange Prize in Fiction, The Poison That Fascinates, and Prayers for the Stolen. She's also the author of several books of poetry, including The Next Stranger, with an introduction by, by W.S. Merwin. Her prize-winning story, A Salamander Child, was published as an art book with work by Mexican painter Gustavo Monroy. Jennifer Clement was awarded the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship for Literature in 2012 for Prayers for the Stolen. In 2014, Ms. Clement was honored with the Sarah Curry Humanitarian Award for that work. She is the recipient of UK's Canongate Prize and the McDowell Colony's Robert and Stephanie Olmsted Fellow for 2007 and 8. Tonight, she will be discussing and reading from Prayers for the Stolen. The novel has been praised in all corners of the literary world and is being published in 24 different languages, from Brazil to Iceland to Thailand, all over. Critics have called the novel enchanting, beguiling, compelling. Our own local Diane Rehm called it beautiful, really, really beautiful. Rick Bass described it this way, Prayers for the Stolen is a magnificent story, filled with a wisdom so dense and ancient as to seem almost unbearable. One wants to turn away, but cannot. It's a mesmerizing read. I agree. Miss Clement was singularly positioned to bring this marvelous work of fiction to life. The story arises from over 11 years of research, interviews with stolen and kidnapped Mexican women. The exquisite writing style arises from her skill as a poet. The sincerity arises from her long love of Mexico. Prayers for the Stolen speaks to women and to the men who love them everywhere on the globe. We are honored and delighted to welcome Ms. Jennifer Clement. Thank you, Julie, for that beautiful introduction. Well, I want to thank a few people before I start. First, I have to thank Joan Naik, wherever you are. <laughs> We've been dreaming this dream for quite a few months now, so I don't know if we woke up or if we went to sleep now that we're here. <laughs> but anyway, I also want to thank um, Julie Wakeman Lynn from the Rockville campus, campus and Robert Giron from the Tacoma Park campus. And, of course, Margaret Latimer for having me here. So I guess I'll start a little bit telling you about the background to the writing of this book. Uh, I imagine that most of you realize that the drug war in Mexico has escalated. And the figures are something like 120,000 dead in the last 10 years. And there's also a genre of literature called narco literature, which is literature about the drug wars. But very little of those works discusses the, ev the effects of violence on women. How is this affecting the women in the country? So I knew that I was interested in trying to understand what was going on, and I didn't really know where that was going to take me. So at first I started out, there were sort of stages in the research. So the, the first stage, consisted of interviewing the women of drug traffickers who were in hiding. They were hiding from uh, men who were violent or else they were very compromised because they had tremendous information, so they knew they couldn't get away because they'd be killed for what they knew. And there was a kind of network all over Mexico, a kind of underground railroad in a way, of women that were being hidden in places, for example, like a, a Kmart, that outside would look like a Kmart, but when you went inside, it was full of hidden women or convents. Even in hotels, uh, some floors of hotels were put aside for hiding women. And then things got too dangerous because of the escalation of the drug war, and so I had to stop doing that. 
and that was when I also um, was voted president of Penn Mexico and the killing of journalists began to escalate. So we have in Mexico 98 journalists who have been killed and eight who are missing and nobody is in jail for having killed a journalist. So part of the problem in Mexico also is the terrible impunity and the fact that uh, the laws don't work and the police enforcement doesn't work and investigations don't work. And on a state level, the drug cartels have infiltrated all the state governments. Uh, this is uh, what you're seeing, for example, with the problem, I don't know how many people are aware of the students that were killed in September in Guerrero, but uh, part of the problem is that there is no law, there's a lawlessness. So it's hard to even investigate these crimes. So doing that, I realized I was becoming aware that a lot of girls were being stolen to be uh, sexually trafficked. And so it's also important to understand the law is not working for that either. So, so the people that are stealing the girls also have complete impunity. Uh, and then when I finished being the president of Penn, that one was when I heard the story that in this area of Guerrero where the students were uh, kidnapped and killed, uh, that they were stealing a lot of girls. Because these drug traffickers are now really what we would call uh, transnational uh, criminal organizations. They're not just little small drug trafficking organizations. They're big, they operate all over the world. And so I asked some of the women, this, this is a very rural area of Mexico, what, what they would do. And they told me, one mother told me, that when they would see the SUVs in the distance driving around looking for pretty girls, they dug holes in the cornfield and would hide their girls in the field so that the, they wouldn't be found. So that was the image that grabbed me and gave birth to the book. Then I spent a lot of time in Guerrero, which I understand Guerrero very well. I feel very at home there. I've been going to that state since I was a little girl. So it was a very natural place for me to set my book. So my book has to do with an area of Guerrero where poppies are grown and where all the major heroin labs are, state-of-the-art heroin labs. So when the students were kidnapped in September, my book came out in Mexico in July, I really felt like a prophet in my own land because I had already been investigating um, the growing of poppies, the heroin labs, and what was going on in that part of Mexico. And the killing of the students has to do with that, uh, the dispute of um, the heroin trade in that part of Mexico. Then, uh, by this time I knew where the book was going and the the last two sort of important pieces of research were to talk to immigrants from Central America because I don't think you can tell the story of America, and I mean all of America, not just the United States of America, uh, without talking about Central America. So Mexico really, uh, I say it in the book, has two borders. The um, border that we all know, and then the border that's coming through Mexico going to the United States. And there's buses that do this, and there's a very famous train that we call the Beast that takes uh, people through Mexico to the United States. So I didn't feel that I could tell this story without having a, a, a character from Central America and discussing this problem. So there's a Guatemalan girl in the book. And lastly, the last part of the book takes place in the woman's jail in Mexico City. So that was sort of the last bit of the research was spending a lot of time in the prison. So another thing has happened since this book came out, and that is that I thought I had written a very local book. I didn't think anybody was going to care that much about some little girls being stolen in Guerrero. But then the book was sold all over the world, and so I've had to travel all over the world with the book. And what's become very apparent is that Girls are being stolen everywhere, all over the world. 
and no country is immune to this, even when I've been to Sweden and Finland, the laws that protect the Swedish and the Finnish women are, are, do not protect the illegal immigrant women. So the African women or the Russian women or the Ukrainian women are not protected and they are being trafficked. So I think the reason, one of the reasons the book um, has been read in so many places is because it's a terrible thing of our time. And the other thing that really shocked me when I wrote the book is the time I spent in the jail. A few times I went to the jail on visitor's day and this particular women's jail is next to uh, a man's jail. And on visitor's day there would be tremendous lines to visit the men and almost nobody would go to visit the women. So if women have no status and have no value and in places like Mexico and many places in the world it's much more grave to steal a car than to steal a girl. It's also true that all over the world, women prisoners are not visited the way that men prisoners are. I mean, it would be interesting to do a study on that. But everywhere I've been, this apparently is the case. So that was another thing that shocked me um, to see just how, how women have no status all over the world. It shows up. So I thought I'd start by reading uh, one of the scenes that has to do with the holes. Run and hide in the hole. What did you say, Mama? Run and hide in the hole, right now, hush. What? Hush, hush. My mother had been outside when she saw a tan-colored SUV in the distance. More than actually seeing it, she heard it. There had been a silence in the jungle as the insects and birds grew still. Quick, she said, run, run. I ran out the front door toward the small clearing at the side of the house and under a small palm tree. The hole was covered with dry palm fronds. I moved the fan-like leaves to one side and scrambled in. From inside, I reached for the fronds and pulled them back over the opening. The hole was too small. My father had dug it up when I was six years old. I had to lie down on my side with my knees at my chest like skeletal remains of ancient burials I'd seen on television. I could see slivers of light peer in on me through the thatch of leaves. I heard the sound of a motor approach. The ground around me trembled as the SUV drove up to our small house and stopped in the clearing right above the hole and above me. My small space became dark as I lay in the shadow of the vehicle. Through the leaves, I could see the SUV's underbelly, a web of tubes and metal. Above me, the motor was turned off. I could hear the sound of the handbrake as it was cranked into place. The car door opened on the driver's side. One brown cowboy boot with a high but square and manly heel stepped out of the car. Those boots did not belong to this land. No one wore boots like that in this heat. As he stood with the car door open, he looked straight at my mother. From the hole, I could see his boots and her red plastic flip-flops face each other. Good day, mother, he said. The man's voice did not belong to this land. The boots and his voice were from the north of Mexico. Is it always this hot here, he asked. How hot do you think it is? My mother did not answer. Ah, mother, put down that gun. The other car door opened. I could not swivel in my hole to try and look around, so I just listened. From the passenger side of the SUV, another man stepped out. Do you want me to shoot her missing? The second man asked. He coughed and wheezed after he spoke. He had an asthmatic voice from the desert, a voice of rattlesnakes and sandstorms. Where's your daughter, hmm? The first man asked. I don't have a daughter. Ah, uh, yes, you do. Don't lie to me, mother. 
I heard a bullet hit the SUV. The vehicle shook above me. I heard the bratata explosion of machine gun fire, along with the sound of the bullets breaking up the adobe brick walls of our home. Then it stopped. The jungle swelled and contracted. Insects, reptiles, and birds stilled, and nothing rubbed against anything. The sky darkened. The machine gun had fired the wind out of the mountain. We were your best hope, mother, the first man said. I birthmarked the place, didn't I? I heard the second man say through a shrill wheeze that became a whistle. The two men got back in the car and slammed the doors shut. The driver turned the key and started the motor. When he placed his boot on the accelerator above me, my hole was filled with the vehicle's exhaust fumes. I opened my mouth and breathed in the noxious smoke. The car backed up and drove off down the path. I breathed deeply. I took in the poison as if it were the smell of a flower or fruit. My mother made me spend the next two hours in that hole. You're not coming out until I hear a bird sing, she said. It was almost dark when she pulled the fronds off of the hole and helped me out. Our little house was sprayed with dozens of bullets. Even the papaya tree had bullet wounds and sweet sap oozed from the holes in the soft bark. Just look at that, my mother said. I turned. She was pointing at the hole with her finger. I peered in and saw four albino shell scorpions there, the deadliest kind. Those scorpions showed you more mercy than any human being ever will, my mother said. She took off one of her flip-flops and killed all four in beating blows. Mercy is not a two-way street, she said. Because we're at a university, there's a theme that runs through the book that I never get to talk about very much, but I'll just bring it up now, is the idea of television knowledge. So one of the things that struck me so much going to these rural communities is that these are people with no education, and yet, they all have small parabolic antennas, little white ones. I talk about it in the book of how that must look from space. And uh, they, they have televisions and sometimes fabulous flat screen big things. And so there's no, um, there's no foundation for what is coming into their lives. And so in, in the book I call it television knowledge. And you know, what does that mean exactly? And it's, it's happening all over the world. And so, uh, for example, the, this mother, Rita, she's an absolute fanatic for documentaries and history documentaries. But she doesn't really understand them. But she is able, because of that, to talk about the pyramids in Egypt, or to talk about the River Styx, or all kinds of things like that in this quirky way. So I'm, I'm interested in, in that and also the way other technologies enter these worlds. For example, one character who's a very unimportant drug dealer, well, he, he does all his drug dealing on Facebook, and everything is set up, like with the spring breakers that come from the United States, it's all set up way ahead of time, and they get to Mexico, and they know that their dealer on Facebook is waiting on such and such a peer. And that's, you know, how the modern world is doing these things nowadays. So there's, there's a discussion of all those kinds of things in the book. In my research, I never met a girl that was stolen and that uh, came back. So, but in my novel, she does come back because as a novelist, I'm able to, to bring her back. And so she can then tell her story of what she saw. So I'm going to read a little bit of that. She comes back. She's obviously very, very traumatized, as you will see. And so I'll read this little section. That afternoon, I found out what had happened to Paula. I was walking down the path that led to the schoolroom when I ran into Paula sitting under a tree. She was sitting on the ground, which we never did, 
on our mountain, we always placed something between our skin and the earth. She was wearing a long dress that covered her like a tent. I knew that insects were crawling up her bare legs under the cloth. I felt the warm black earth under my feet. The ground had brought us together. I wanted to hold her hand. Her face was bent over as she looked at something in her lap. I walked slowly toward her, the way I had learned to walk when I wanted to catch a small garter snake or baby iguana. As I approached, my body came between her body and the sun, and I covered her with the eclipse of my shadow. She looked up, and I sat next to her on the ground. I knew I'd be brushing black and red ants off my skin within a minute. Paula's dress was covered with black ants swarming all over. A few had already migrated up her clothes, crawled around her neck and behind her ears. She did not flick them off. Don't you feel so sorry for Britney Spears, Paula said. <coughs> the long sleeves of Paula's dress were folded over and pushed up. On her left arm, the inside where the skin is pale and thin like guava skin, I could see a row of cigarette burns, circles, polka dots, pink circles. You know, Paula continued, Brittany has many tattoos. Yes, no, I didn't know. Oh, yes. She has a fairy and a small daisy circling her toe. No, I didn't know. And she has a butterfly and another flower and a small star on her right hand. Oh, really? Yes, her body is like a garden. Do you know who I am, I asked? Oh, yes, of course. Your lady die. I brushed a few ants off her legs and arms. Get up, I said. The ants are going to eat you alive if you sit here any longer. The ants? Does your mother know where you are? I took hold of her wrists and helped lift her up. I will take you home, I said. Let me be with you for a little longer. I like you, Paula said. You're nice to me. I held her hand and walked with her toward a log a few steps away. We can't sit on the ground, I said. We sat down side by side, looking forward, as if we were on a bus heading down a highway. I took her hand in mine and looked at the pattern of cigarette burns on the inside belly skin of her arm. I've seen tigers and lions, she said, real ones. It wasn't a zoo. Tell me. At that place, there was a garage for the cars and a garage for the animals. You can tell me. Paula described the ranch. It was in the north of Mexico in the state of Tamaulipas, right on the U.S. border. An important drug trafficker who was known by the nickname McLean after Bruce Willis's character in the movie Die Hard lived with his wife and four children. McLean had been a policeman. I was his slave mistress, Paula said. Slave mistress? Yes, we call ourselves that, all of us do. At one end of the ranch, there was a garage that housed McLean's cars which included four BMWs, two Jaguars, and several pickup trucks and SUVs. Next to the garage, there were cement rooms that contained a lion and three tigers. Paula learned from the caretakers that the animals had been bought from zoos in the United States. The property also contained its own small cemetery with four large mausoleums that were the size of little houses. Each mausoleum even had a bathroom. It wasn't a zoo. Every day, the lion and tiger excrement was picked up and wrapped into drug shipments bound for the United States. This practice kept the drug-sniffing border dogs away from the shipments. Paula's job on the ranch was to sleep with McLean every now and again and to help pack the lion and tiger excrement around the drugs or rub a small film of the excrement on the outside of plastic packages. Someone told me they were fed human meat, Paula said. The sky began to darken as we sat on the log holding hands. In the dusk, small clouds of mosquitoes began to surround us. But since Paula continued to talk, I sat there and let them bite. She didn't seem to notice the feeling of insects crawling 
or biting her skin. I don't need to tell you that along the way, I was a plastic water bottle, right? Paula said. I was something you pick up and take a swig of. I shook my head, no, no. Those guys who stole me were from Matamoros. They took me north to that party. It was McLean's daughter's birthday party. She was 15. A whole circus had, be rent had been rented. Several large tents had been set up in a field to one side of the ranch house. A man walked around giving away clouds of pink cotton candy on long wood sticks. There was a band and a large dance floor. Paula was taken to one of the tents that had been placed very far away from the party. She could hardly hear the band play. Inside this tent, there were a few men and over 30 women. Rows of plastic chairs were set up on one side of the tent. In the middle of the open space, there was a table with Cokes, beers, plastic glasses, and paper plates piled high with peanuts covered in red chili powder. The women in the tent had been stolen. The drug traffickers who killed Paula's mother's dogs and had stolen her wrapped naked in a white towel were now going to sell her. McLean was in the tent. He looked at the women and asked them to smile. He wanted to see their teeth. But he didn't look into Paula's mouth. McLean picked Paula. He picked the most beautiful girl in Mexico. She should have been a legend. Her face should have covered magazines. Love songs should have been written to her. And then I'll skip a little to the end of this chapter. Why do you have those cigarette burns on your arm? Oh, but we all have them, Lady Di. She looked down at the inside of her arm, stretching it out before her as if she were showing me the page of a book. If you've been stolen, you burn the inside of your left arm with cigarettes. Why? I don't understand. Are you crazy, she asked. Are you stupid? I'm sorry. A woman decided it a long, long time ago, and now we all do it, she said. If we're found dead someplace, everyone will know we were stolen. It's our mark. My cigarette burns are a message. I looked at the pattern of circles on her arm as she continued to hold her limb, stretched out like an oar into the jungle air. You do want people to know it's you. Otherwise, how will our mothers find us? It was almost dark. We have to go now, I said. Come with me. I'll take you. Her mother was standing at the front door waiting. She held a baby bottle filled with milk in one hand. It's time for my baby to go to bed, Concha said. What on earth were you doing out in the jungle? Paula didn't answer and went straight into the house. Her mother walked me to the edge of their property. Did she say anything to you, Concha asked. Don't say anything to anyone, Concha said in a panic. How did they know she was here? Who watched and knew a beautiful girl lived up here? They came for her. They knew what they were coming for. If they know she's back, if they find out, they'll come back and get her. We have to leave. There's no time. In a day or so. I've been planning, Lady Di. We're escaping. What did she tell you? She told me about the cigarette burns. Did she tell you that she did it to herself? Did she tell you that all the women who have been robbed do this to themselves? I nodded. Do you believe her? Concha asked. I don't believe it at all. I can't imagine burning myself. That's impossible. Yes, I believe it. At that moment, Paula appeared behind her mother. She was like a white, vaporous creature. She held a baby bottle in one hand. She was naked. In the dark, under a river of moonlight, I could see the nipples of her breasts, the black hair between her legs, and the constellation of cigarette burns all over her body. I could see the cigarette burn stars that made up Orion and Taurus. Even her feet were covered in the round burns. Paula had walked through the Milky Way, and every star had burned her body. So, on to happier subjects. 
Um, the protagonist is called Lady Di after the princess, and I won't give away why, but there are quite a few Lady Dies in the countryside in Mexico and also in Central America, all named after, after Princess Lady Diana, who for me is the complete anti-Cinderella figure. So everything went wrong for her. We all thought she was Cinderella, but she sure wasn't. So there's a sort of, in a way, an homage to her, but she's named that uh, for, for an unexpected reason that you would find out if you, when you read the book. So in all my books, everybody always falls in love at first sight. And in giving workshops, I, I'm sometimes said, well, you know, but that was too fast. They fell in love too fast in your book. And so I would say, well, isn't that how, how it happens? So I think the world sometimes might be divided into those who fall in love at first sight and those who don't. And obviously I do, <laughs> because my people do. So um, Lady Di goes to work in Acapulco and she meets the gardener Julio. And this is the moment of the meeting. So I'll just finish with the meeting and then a little end of their love story, a little piece of their love story so that we can leave here feeling good and not feeling sad. <laughs> the very next morning, Julio the gardener walked through the front door and I fell in love. He walked right into my body. He climbed up my ribs and into me. I thought to myself, say a prayer for ladders. I wanted to smell his neck and place my mouth on his mouth and taste him and hold him. I wanted to smell the smell of garden and grass and palm tree, smell of rose and leaf and lemon flower. I fell in love with the gardener and his name was Julio. I spent the morning following him around the garden. He trimmed, dug and cut. He rubbed the leaves of a lemon tree between his fingers and smelled them. He took a few flat silver seeds out of the back pocket of his jeans and pressed them into the dirt. He used long shears to cut the grass. After an hour, he left and went to get a ladder from the garage so that he could cut the Mexican pink bougainvillea that grew along one wall and beside the life-sized bronze horse. As he snipped at the overgrown branches, yellow pollen was shaken into the air and the flowers, like paper flowers, covered the ground. Julio was in his early 20s. His skin was deeply tanned from working in the sun all day. He had a short afro that stood, stood like a black crown above him and light brown eyes. Julio was kind to the flowers and the leaves. He cupped the roses with his hands as if he was honored to hold them. He twirled vines between his fingers as if they were locks of hair. He walked gently on the grass as if he did not want the small blades to break or even bend under his weight. Plants in my life had always been something to fight against. Trees were filled with tarantulas. Vines strangled everything. Large red ants lived under roots and snakes hid near the prettiest flowers. I also knew to stay away from the unusual dry brown patches of jungle that were suffocating from the herbicide dropped by the helicopters. That poison would continue to burn through the land for decades. Everyone on my piece of mountain always dreamed of the city and all that cement where no insect survived. We could never imagine why anyone would want a garden. Because I loved Julio, the cars and trucks outside on the street sounded like rivers. The diesel smoke from passenger buses smelled like flowers and the rotten five-day-old garbage by the front door smelled sweet. Cement walls became mirrors. My small, ugly hands turned into starfish. In those hours that I followed Julio around the garden, he never spoke to me. After Julio left each day, I sat in my room and prayed. I prayed that the beautiful garden of bougainvillea trees, roses, bowers, lemon and magnolia trees would dry up and that the lawn would become overgrown with weeds. 
I prayed that Julio would have to come to the house every day to take care of his sick garden. And this is the last little bit about that love story. Since I was a person who had never experienced cold weather, I loved to close the door and windows and turn up the air conditioning until the room was freezing. My teeth chattered. My teeth al seemed almost to break against each other. I had never felt that kind of cold before. I loved it. I even loved the pain of it. This room is the North Pole, Julio said. He never asked me to turn the air conditioning off. I would gather up all the blankets I could find from around the house and pile them on the bed. I had never slept in a cold room under blankets. This is because you grew up in the jungle, Julio said. I grew up close to the desert where it can get very cold. At night, in our Acapulco igloo, Julio told me his philosophy. Life is a crazy, out of order, inside out, salt mixed with sugar place where the drowned can be walking on dry land, he said. Like the best outlaws, I know I'm going to die young. I don't even think about old age. It's not even in my imagination. You have tamed me, I answered. I picked up his hand from the pillow and cuffed it around my wrist. Julio thought people could be divided into day and night people. He said words could be divided this way also. Ugly night words, according to him, were words like rabies and nausea. Pretty night words were words like moon and milk and moth. When Julio and I moved around under the blankets, sparks of electricity crackled and lit up, lit up our bed. Never had we seen anything like this before, only in the sky. We would make love in the wool blanket lightning. Thank you. Jennifer Clemens, thank you for coming and sharing with us. Um, I just had a, a question. Um, while reading your book, I, uh, I started to sense a uh, strong sense of um, community in order for these mothers to um, protect their their young daughters. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did you feel or, or how important was the uh, sense of community and strong bond for the, uh, the daughters to survive in Mexico? I think that you're right. I think there's a strong bond among the women. I think one of the things that the book is telling or one of the stories that is telling is how um, the lack of protection from men toward their women and so this occurs for many reasons, uh, but it's uh, definitely a generalized thing, and there are whole communities now that only are made up of women. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming and for writing this. Um, could you talk about if you uh, uh, had fears for your own safety during the research and what you did about that? Mm -hmm. Uh, whether I had fears for my safety doing the research. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I was interviewing the women in hiding, I used to go in with protection, with two cellular telephones. I had people that I had to call when I went in and people I would call when I got out. And then, uh, then I stopped that work because it did get just too dangerous. It was, you know, it's, it was as though the anthill had been stomped on, so nobody knew where the ants were, and it was, it was hard to try and control that anymore. And then as president of Penn, I had, you know, things happen like slashing of all my tires on several occasions, the cutting of my phone line, the cutting of the internet cable, sort of vandalism type of things, a couple of funny phone calls. But with the coming out of the book, I haven't had anything happen since, the, the, and the book has been um, much to my sort of amazement has been so well received in Mexico and, and people love the book there. And I didn't know how that was going to go down, but I haven't had any repercussions from the book itself. No. There's a lot about mothers and 
females are obviously the main point of the uh, story, but what about the fathers of these girls and brothers? I read a little bit online before coming, um, a little synopsis of the book, and it talked about how you uh, described them disguising them as men, as boys also. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, what about the fathers and brothers of these women? Well, it's a little bit um, what the previous question was about. I, I think it's complex. I mean, the men have disappeared for many reasons. I mean, one is that they've come to the United States and they create second families here. That is becoming less and less so because it's harder and harder to come to the United States now because the drug cartels, which as I said, are not really drug cartels anymore, have taken over the border. So it used to be your uncle so-and-so of so-and-so that would help you cross. Now, I mean, they're killing tons of people on the border, as you've read about. So it's not so easy. And, uh, and also because of the fence. The fence was planned so that the only way to cross would be through the Arizona desert. So the Arizona desert is just a total graveyard of dead immigrants. And that was planned, that that would be that way. Um, and so... Then there's the men that are looking for work in other states because the unemployment is bad. Then there's the men that are victims of violence themselves. They've been killed. Or they've gotten caught up in this, not maybe out of choice, but because they don't have a choice. And then I think it's a problem on a, on a, more, on a deeper level. I think it's a universal problem. I think that there's an absence. I mean, because this book has taken me, I didn't know that I had written a protest novel when I wrote it. It wasn't my intention. It, but it, that's what it is now that it's in the world. And uh, so I've had to be on a lot of human rights panels and panels about trafficking or about violence against women. And it's just every country, it's women talking to women, women talking to women, women talking to women. Uh, everybody's talking about Nicholas Kristof, who writes in the New York Times because he seems to be the only man on board and even the huge United Nations campaign, the face of that campaign is Emma Watson, is that her name, Hermione? She's the face of that campaign. So even in, even in these campaigns where you would want, you know, very important, powerful men to be advocating for women, it's not happening. So I say to all of you men in this room, we need you. Yes. Uh, 43 students were kidnapped in Guerrero in, on the 26th of September last year and disappeared and then found that they had been burned in a dump on pyres of tires and then the ashes had been placed in jumbo-sized plastic garbage bags and placed in a river. So only the remains of one of the students was able to be tested using uh, DNA, but, but maternal DNA, the most, uh, the last DNA that's left in anything, because that bag st stayed closed. All the other bags were thrown in the river open so that the remains dispersed. So for the parents, they don't accept this version of events. They don't accept that their children have died. They don't accept that all what the witnesses are saying happened. But it's cr caused a huge commotion and it probably has to do with the fact that that whole area of Mexico is where the poppies are grown and the, where the heroin labs are. And the heroin coming into the United States in the last four years has increased fourfold. There's no way that Mexico can solve this problem without the United States. It's a terrible marriage. So all the drugs are coming to the United States and if American gun dealers, both illegal and legal ones, were to stop sending guns to Mexico, 47% of American gun dealers would be out of business. So, just imagine the economics of all of this. I notice the way you're reading your book, it's, it's really good. You sound like you're grieving on, on the way you're reading it. Has something happened during the time that um, in, in your life in Mexico that has uh, triggered your inspiration on writing this book? Yeah, I, I think I consider the book a requiem 
Mm -hmm. For sure, it's it's. Is it too personal that you can't share it, or I no, mean, no, I no? That I right? that my the sadness you feel is a sadness that I feel toward what has happened to the country that I love. Because coming from a country that has sold their own daughter just for uh, tonight's food or dinner, I'm from the Philippines. Yeah, so you know. <laughs> yes. Yep. The way you have mentioned the drug cartels is like vindictively being, being the cause of this, uh, of this human trafficking. Like they're the one handling it. Mm -hmm. My question is, would it be different on a different country like, like I am? Well, the drugs aren't being produced in the Philippines, but there's terrible trafficking of women in the Philippines and of children. Uh, the, re the thing that's happened in Mexico, first of all, Mexico used to be a transit country from Colombia, and the Mexicans smartly realized they didn't need Colombia. They didn't have to be the transit for anybody, and they took it over, the, the, the drug cartel business. But they've also expanded their business. They're, they're now transnational mafia, so they not only deal in drugs, they deal in arms, they deal in money laundering schemes, tremendous money laundering schemes, but they also have figured out which, that, that trafficking of people is where the big money is because a bag of drugs you can sell one time. A girl you can sell many times a day. This is why human trafficking and human slavery and debt bondage and all these things are so huge in the whole world now because, because economically uh, selling people is the big business. Was that your uh, resource on writing this book? I mean, on, on how you... Well, I think it's important to say yourself. that I'm not a sociologist. I'm, I'm a writer, I'm a poet, so even when I do the research, I'm not doing it as a social worker or as a lawyer or as a politician. Um, I'm always doing it from the point of view of poetry. I'm looking for the symbol, I'm looking for the metaphor. Of course, I have to know what I'm writing about, but that's not my primary concern. Oh, thank you for being honest. Thank you. <laughs> so one of, I think, my favorite characters in the book is Lady Di's mother. She's magnificent. <laughs> um, she, did you, could you speak a little bit about where you drew inspiration for her character and specifically, like she seems to be, I don't know if you would use this word, but superstitious, um, mm -hmm. where you drew inspiration for that? It's mysterious, I don't know. I mean, uh, I sort of fall in love with my characters as I go too. So, and they sort of go revealing themselves. But yeah, I mean, I'm interested in superstition and in Mexico, we can be very superstitious. The etymology of that word is great fear of the gods. <laughs> so I definitely have that. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just, I, I just really related to her anger of, of not having her man and loving him and, and, and not being able to protect her family and not being able to keep it to, I mean, there's so much pain in her. Um, she can't even listen to love songs anymore, you know? So yes, she's angry, but she's also, for me, sort of symbolic of a lot of, the, the expression of a lot of the feelings. I know it's not only in Mexico that, you know, the, the traffic is all over the world. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, most of the time, those girls are for poor family, uneducated, the men too, and sometimes the men are not there. And I would like to know, since you wrote this book, did you went back there? You know, because you say, people like it, like the book over there. And I would like to know, what do you think with social media today, communication, how can we do to fight, you know, or to do something to help those people who live in that fear, that mother, she was so afraid that they would take her daughter away. You know, she has to find a place to hide her, you know, even that those insects 
was pity. They didn't do anything to her. It's, it's so sad to see that people are living in the world like that, such, in such a pain. What can we do to help them? Do you think we can do like us? We, we are in the United States, yes. It's like, OK, we are far from what is going back there. Mm -hmm. But since we are here, what can we do to help those who are still there? And for the men, it's good for them to be here. What I, I, want, I want to say, too, is for them to get involved. It's not only the women fight. They need to help us to do that. So yes. I would like to know. OK, uh, there's sort of a more sort of global answer and a particular answer. I mean, if yeah. anybody's interested in donating money to an organization in Mexico that's helping trafficked women, I know of one. I'd be happy to give you the, the website of that place, which is a very honorable place. In terms of what's going on in the world, I don't know if I, I don't think I have the answer, but somehow or other, women have to have more status, they have to have more value. And the other thing is that we have to be very aware that women, we ourselves learn patrimony. We learn it, we live it, we practice it. So when you have, you know, mothers in India aborting all their girl fetuses, it's the mothers that are aborting, it's the mothers that are making that decision because they, are in a patriarchal society. And so they are also um, uh, making that happen. So we have to change our way of thinking. And, and what I said earlier, I think it's, it's really important to have men care and men voice uh, their outrage, not just women. Um, I just had a quick question. If you look at the circumstances that render women in Mexico so vulnerable to trafficking. What's the implication of those circumstances on Mexican machismo? Well, I just think it's one of the reasons it, it happens so easily is because of the machismo. But in Mexico, we don't have any figures because we don't keep them to know how many girls are being stolen. There's, there's no way to know, but in the United States, which has a very imperfect uh, numbers, but they're, within their imperfect numbers, just a city like Atlanta, they estimate that 300 girls are vulnerable every month. So it's happening here, it's happening outside the door. It's every place. You said that the women in jail were, like they didn't have any visitors and what do you think, like, why the woman who gave a life to, like, I, I guess they have a kids, I guess they have a family, why they don't have a visitors? Like, the man who maybe worked for the family, but didn't give a life, but still, like, they have a like, long line of visitors. You know, how can, how can the people be so, how I would say, like, how can it be that the woman is, doesn't have any value, any like, care, any help or support from the family when they're, while they're in jail? Maybe they're in jail because, of the, like, because they wanted to help their family. They mm -hmm. are sometimes, yeah. I yeah. think it's the same answer. Um, women also learn patriarchy. So the mothers and the sisters and the wives are going to visit the men in prison. They're not going to visit the daughters and the sisters and the mothers in prison because the lines to visit the men are full of women. It's not as though it's men visiting men. It's tons of women visiting the men. Yeah, this is so. So women themselves perpetrate it. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is very ironic. <laughs> so you were talking about the comparison between the drug trafficking and human tra trafficking. And I was wondering, you said there's large multinational corporations for drug trafficking. Is human trafficking like large multinational corporations or is it on the individual level? Are they taking young women or are they transporting them all, all of around the, the world? It's happening in all those ways. <laughs> yeah. They're not transnational corporations, they're mafias. Yeah. Transnational crime organizations. What 
what's happening in Mexico and in the United States in terms of public policy and laws dealing with this situation? Well, not very much. <laughs> But I'm not an expert. If there's things going on that aren't sort of in the public eye, I don't know. But definitely, when you think of how many guns are going to Mexico, nobody seems to care. Thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Um, can you address the gun situation? Because you know, we have this habit of saying, oh, we're going to change things because this terrible thing happened. And then we don't, because obviously people are in power that don't want things changed. Um, th this statistic of 47% um, of gun dealers, legal and illegal, would close down if we stopped the trafficking in guns to Mexico. How do we use this to really affect some change, recognizing that Power is power, and K Street is K Street. And what can we do about it? Well, I, you know, I think in the United States, we're not doing anything about it. So to ask that something happen about doing something that would benefit another country seems to be a zillion miles away from the discourse. It's a mystery, the Second Amendment, and how it's interpreted. Uh, I, I don't understand it. Um, I've written actually a lot about guns. <laughs> it's um, a theme for me. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I really wish the Mexican government would say no more. And just as there's a wall that stops illegal immigration to the United States, there should be a wall that stops guns going to Mexico. I mean, that would interest me. I don't see that happening, which makes you think it has to be for economic reasons, the lobby, and, uh, and this completely amoral capitalism that we're all living around. Thank you. Thank you very much.